bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at this expense of the poor of the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Sister Mary Jo, who will be sitting, taking over this seat because we can't have two machines open, just to explain. Um, anyway, Sister Mary Jo, who's now based in Nordfer, Spirituality Center um, in North Wales, um, was before that working for 20 years in Brazil in the Human Rights Center, along with Patrice, Sister Patrice Power, who worked in a women's health center. And alongside that, they were very involved with the base communities of Brazil, in Brazil. These experiences formed a profound understanding of community and hospitality, which they brought back to, with them to Nodfa. And Nodfa actually means a place of refuge and welcome in Welsh. We hope today that Mary Jo can help us to understand how the model of base communities can inform us about working in a unified community and help us with the, new, with the work of the new Eucharistic do-it-yourself groups we are in the process of setting up. Dear Merku has just led a weekend on the spirit and empowerment, culminating in a very different kind of Eucharist agape with all the participants totally equal and welcome. Jesus welcomes all to the feast. We now welcome Mary Jo. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Hello, everybody. It's hard to talk about community in theory. So here I am with Sue. And I'm starting again by talking about the basic Christian communities in Brazil, because that's what marked me and taught me about community. And it's what I felt was the best experience of church that I ever experienced. I'm in front of the hanging that I spoke about the last time with Root and Branch, the ones that Patrice and I were given representing our 20 years working with the basic Christian communities there in Paraíba in Brazil. The diocesan coordination of the basic Christian communities were the ones who thought about this, who organized what should go onto it, and one of them painted it. So they're the ones that have the real experience of basic Christian communities. And so that is their representation, representation of, of what the communities do. Um, there are pictures of various scenes, if you remember before, um, and seen as a whole for me, it, it shows what liberation theology is about. Um, I think I understood liberation theology easily, seeing it in practice in Brazil but also because of my background. I was brought up in a very Catholic environment with a belief in social equality and an understanding that the struggle for that was through trade unions and politics. But I remember when after entering, I was in my first year of teaching and, and one of the parishioners came to the door canvassing for the Conservative Party. I was absolutely shocked I couldn't understand how anyone who read the gospel and went to mass could be a conservative. So I felt quite at home in Brazil, but the struggle for justice in, was in the local community and expressed in church and through politics, and they were bound. There are certain things you have to experience though before it really hits you. And I go back to one day during our second or third week in language school, just soon after we had arrived in Brazil. And we were taken to a favela outside Brasilia. That really hit me more because of the 
the smell, the smell of the open sewers and the smell of the raw meat hanging on market stalls, as well as the sight of the places where families lived. It only hit me properly when we got back and the English speaking group had prayer together and we were using the Magnificat. I remember sharing that it was only then it hit me that the phrases were not just images or metaphors. The phrases suddenly became real. He has pulled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things, the rich sent empty away. I saw this as what God wanted in Brazil and in the world. And I wanted to do what I could to make this word come true by entering into the struggle for justice and equality. I've talked about this because I think that was one of my experiences of what is shown in the hanging. Um, if I can stand up, you can see, I um, hope you can hear me, but the Bible here is central to all the scenes. You have people in the favelas wanting good housing, education and health. Up here is the picture you saw of the sugarcane workers who were punished for praying or talking together. Here, people who were put off the land and they're camping, waiting for some kind of justice or settlement. And up above that, it's a mutiran. It's people helping others who haven't got houses to build them. The roots are because it's basic Christian communities. But here we have the Bible is central. The light is coming from it. And we have the burning bush. The sign of God's presence that is there. So just going over that. Um, I, I wanted to show that again because I think it's such a good um, representation of what they were about. Um, the Bible, the word of God is central. And it's the essence of the Christian community. Each story is about fighting for justice and what inspires and encourages each group is the word of God. Not just personal prayer, but breaking open the word, sharing what is happening in our lives and actions that come from that. In our liturgy each week, which was prepared either at a community meeting or by the youth group, the reflection time after the reading was open to all. It was meaningful because they understood the readings through their lives. The exodus, the stories of the exile, for example, were interpreted through their experience of being displaced, either because of drought or because their right to the land was not respected. And they were thrown off land out of their houses to go to the favelas in the city. So it's interesting, I think, that the Bible is central, not a church building. The light that guides them is shining from it. And the study of the Bible was very important in the communities. It was well organized by SEBI, the National Ecumenical Movement, for helping people to read the Bible and study. There were courses at diocesan level, a national level, but many groups at parish level. This gave the people confidence to share and interpret the Bible without depending on the priest's homily, telling them what it was about. The burning bush is coming from the trunk, the sign of God's presence with the people and new life. And the, the picture that you saw that was sent out uh, in the middle of sugar cane is where the plantation owners did not allow the workers to meet to pray as they might talk about their rights. It was terribly hard work and their pay was much lower than the minimum wage. But here they are singing and praying. That's in. Oh, there, you can't see. <laughs> anyway, the focus of the communities and the diocese was not so much about praying so that we would go to heaven, but building up the kingdom of God where we live. So the challenge is to see what community 
is for us and what is Eucharistic community. But we can belong to all sorts of communities, all different sizes. We have family, small book groups, our local church, or online communities like Greenpeace or Liberty, who actually invite people to be part of their community, even though they have a very large membership. In this way, Root and Branch is community, uniting those who have a strong desire for reform in the Catholic Church and giving us inspiration, as well as goals and means to work for justice. But then there are much bigger communities. More and more, we're aware of belonging to the Earth community. For the last two days, we've been with Dirma Tamaruhu, who reminds us that we are Earthlings and we are more of the, aware of the earth. And we realize now how it nourishes us as our mother. So that's one of the big communities, but also internationally in this age of instant news, we feel for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, Syria, Palestine, and many African countries. We pray for them and we can have a certain relationship with them some by living and working with refugees and asylum seekers and others by helping them financially. So that's the wider community. But what we're seeking as community is usually a smaller group where we can share and be challenged and inspired by those who share the same beliefs. Sometimes a liturgy in a large church can make us feel like community. I watched Ianthi's funeral online but I felt I was part of it because I knew her and I knew those who did the readings. However, as I said, most of us are looking for a smaller community where we can break bread and share our thoughts. I think that what makes a community strong is the relationship between our praying together and our actions. So are we part of a huge community as followers of Jesus? What are the actions that could identify us as Christians? Anna Rowlands from Durham University at a meeting of JPIC animators of religious congregations just last weekend, spoke a lot about Catholic social teaching and said that Matthew 25 is fundamental in following Jesus. Let's hear some of the verses. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. These acts of mercy are about creating a just world. Anna said the idea of the common good has re-emerged in social movements now spanning the whole political spectrum, from radical left to center to right. For green movements, it's been a way to think about a common life and a common habitation of an imperiled earth. I heard a quote from Bob Hopkins about community this week. If we wait for the government, it'll be too late. If we act as individuals, it'll be too little. But if we act as communities, it might just be enough. I see the purpose and actions of Root and Branch as the work of a community, a community within the church, but reaching out, representing many whose voice is not heard, loving the church enough to speak out, speaking to the official church, to the press and radio, and uniting others who feel forgotten by the Catholic church. The question is, how do we celebrate this action? How do we support and inspire each other as Christians? How do we grow in companionship? How do we form small groups where we can celebrate our lives, our beliefs and actions in a meaningful way? So I suggest we look at the first Christian communities. Um, you can't see, I have the, the big picture of the Fraxio Panis. Um, just beside me, but I don't want to move the camera, but I have got a little picture of it as well. 
that I think you it was what you sent out. Um, can't get it right on the uh, camera. There we are. That picture just to remind us. Um, that's from the catacombs of St. Priscilla. And we have the big one that's here um, that I've taken from the dining room. But it's where women are breaking bread together. There we are. Thank you. How do we see these people and those in the Acts of the Apostles? We know their names and what they do. Strong spirits who were ready to give all that they possessed to the poor and give their lives for their beliefs. They were killed by the state authorities. So they were a threat to the status quo. How did they encourage each other so they were strong enough to face persecution? We can imagine they met for a meal. They told stories about Jesus. They read letters from St. Paul and others that inspired them. They must have talked about how they felt and how their faith affected their lives. Their participation in these meals made them strong and ready to go out and act in the wider community, whatever it cost. We know that in a lot of these first communities, the leaders were women. In Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 16, we have Phoebe, a servant of the church, Priscilla, Mary, Trophena and Trifosa, and Julia. And we see that there was equality. Like the women in the picture of the fresco from Priscilla's catacombs, they didn't model themselves on the synagogue. This should give us a freedom. We don't need to model the church that came into being after the fourth century when Constantine wanted the Christian church to unite his empire. The early Christian community should also inspire us to get involved with our neighbors and social issues. So community today, what do we think of? There are alternative communities who are living together with respect for the earth. Then I think Pax Christi is a community with clear objectives and mission, who pray together, give witness together and spread the message of justice and peace with nonviolent protests. Women in black who have the same mission give weekly witness in the middle of London at the Edith Cavell statue and through the internet. These organizations remind us that Jesus in his mission had a position of challenging the powers of the day, but did it in a nonviolent way and by talking to the crowds. Is the internet today the same kind of thing as talking to the crowds? I don't know. Um, I was just thinking of myself as a, a religious sister. For religious communities who were founded in the 18th and 19th century, perhaps it's more difficult to pinpoint their outreach to the community today, because ones that started as teachers and nurses have turned to other things. But when we watch the, the midwives on TV, we see women who had a very clear mission to the community and they were very much part of the community. But as years pass, they keep questioning their role and what they need to change. And so I see how we've questioned ourselves here because coming back here to Nodfer, the words on our cross gave us a very clear motivation about what we should do because it says um, that all may have life. Ut vitam habiant, John 10. And so, well, it gives us a, a very wide scope there that all may have life. But when we face the challenge of doing something different at a retreat center, when not so many nuns and priests were coming on retreat, we listen to people here in Penn and the national news about the difficulties that carers had in looking after family members who needed full-time care and realized that one thing we could do was offer short breaks or respite to carers at a reduced price. At that time, an act was passed in parliament to ensure that there would be a grant for this and an insurance that the member of the family who was sick or had a disability would be cared for in a care home. If there was no other provision, they would do that. 
but sometimes they were able to leave them with relations. We still have carers who come because they feel at home here and though they can have a good rest with time on the beach or in the hills, but the government help isn't so good now. We've had lots of different groups who come, among them some trans people who wanted to pray and meet somewhere where they felt accepted. We are very privileged to meet so many people who feel they're at home here. To think of another kind of community, uniting churches, um, here in the town we have churches together in Pen Mai Ma, which unites all Christians, who express community by sharing soup and desserts once a month and raising money for Christian aid and also organizing events for significant days like Good Friday, which we celebrate together, and Women's World Day of Prayer and other times. But now onto a much wider scope, thinking of us as belonging to the earth and being one with all creatures and life on earth. Um, I went to COP26 in Glasgow. There were representatives of governments and multinationals with their own interests. But a lot of people came because of their love of the earth, motivation from their own experience and inspiration from others. There were different church communities, Green Christian, people from the Laudato Si movement. And by the way, Laudato Si week begins today. So these movements which involve people online and through their parishes, challenging their lifestyle, but helping them to pray as earthlings, remembering our roots. And there were many others from different ecological movements. But out of all, the people that stay most in my memory are the indigenous people who said that they know how to relate to the earth because from birth, they're aware of the expanded kinship of networks around them which include human beings, along with the beings of the land, water, air, and the plants and trees. Is the main thing we have to learn today that we're one community with all living things. I think each community needs to have this awareness of being one with the earth and the universe. It takes time to be aware of our relationship with all living things, this kinship, and we have to foster that relationship. Ilya Delio says, where is the risen Christ? Everywhere and all around us. In you, your neighbor, the dogwood tree outside, the budding grapevine, the ants, popping up through the cracks. The whole world is filled with God, who is shining through even the darkest places of our lives. To go to church is to awaken to this divine presence in our midst and respond in love with a yes. Your life, O oh God, is my life and the life of the planet. But we need nourishment to live out Matthew 25 as followers of Jesus. We need to support each other. So our group for reflection and support has to be one where we feel at home. We need something more than what we receive in most churches. Dear Mutamoriku has been here with us this weekend, talking about the great spirit. We had an agape, as Sue said, just before lunch, where we were able to participate in a very meaningful way and in a way that any of us could celebrate together. We can do this simply, sharing our lives, our food and our prayers together. Michael Hines, quoted by Ilya Delio, says, a sacrament is anything that awakens, enlivens or expands the imagination, opens the vision of the inner eye and enriches the sensitivity of any human being. This can be a flower, the sea, a picture of a scan of a baby in the womb. 
So any of these can be sacraments to us, but we also need a place where we can come together with other people to share these sacraments and to encourage each other. We have to find this group, which can be our church, that will send us out to be good Samaritans, the kind that's needed for today's world. And then we can join with other wider groups that inspire us. So we have intimate communities and larger communities where we feel we belong and which send us out to be Christians in today's world. And so I hope that's a help to helping everybody to think about where we need to go from here. I wish I was an artist. And if I were an artist, I would like to draw a diagram like yours, only about Salisbury, because I see um, wonderful things happening in Salisbury, lots of different groups, lots of different Eucharistic communities, but all inspired by the Bible and those wonderful rays of light going out and the Holy Spirit in all the separate groups, which is absolutely wonderful. And I have to report that um, Salisbury Catholic churches, and there are five of us, five sets really, we actually did have a tea party in a hotel two Sundays ago, just to try to do something different. And that was a wonderful experiment. It was a little bit stilted, but nevertheless, it was a start. Um, I also thought that what you said about COP26 was wonderful, because there again, you've got an example of the Holy Spirit inspiring lots of different countries and groups to come together for something which is holistic and positive and wonderful. And finally, one of our groups said that they loved hearing, but can't quite remember exactly what you said about the sacrament. So I'm just pleased that we've got a recording so that we can listen to it more intently. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>